Hello, and welcome to the third installment of our five-part series on strategies for recruiting students to the humanities. Thanks very much for joining us. I'm Scott Muir, Project Director for Study the Humanities, which, with generous support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, supports efforts to attract more undergraduates to the humanities. Today, I'm very pleased to be joined by three leaders of successful efforts to market humanities majors, courses, and events. Ashley Bender, Associate Professor of English and BA in English Program Coordinator at Texas Women's University. Melissa Velisca Gregory, Associate Dean for the Humanities and Professor of English at the University of Toledo. And Oliver Rosales, Professor of History and Faculty Coordinator for the Social Justice Institute at Bakersfield College. In our next installment in the series, we'll explore strategies for fostering humanities identity and community at this hour on July 29th. And in the fall, we'll host a final webinar on how you can leverage the expertise and resources developed by scholarly societies to attract more undergraduates to the humanities. Today, our focus is on strategies for reaching key audiences to generate more interest in studying the humanities. We plan to have plenty of time for discussion and questions from the audience today following these three presentations. Please submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. We'll be sharing some links to the chat, but please be sure to submit your questions via Q&A rather than the chat so they don't get lost. We'll try to field as many of your broader questions for the entire panel as possible. We've had an overabundance of questions at previous events in the series, so we'll be collecting the questions and submitted through the Q&A so that our panelists can focus on the discussion at hand and provide answers to your specific questions and their individual initiatives afterwards. So look for those to be shared via a follow-up email in the next few days. Before we hear from our presenters, I'd like to take a moment to frame today's conversation in light of our uh, research on effective recruitment models, which you can explore through the link that I'll share in the chat. Um, and respondents to our 2019 Humanities Recruitment Survey, just put this in here, uh, rated lack of understanding of humanities disciplines and discouragement from parents and other influences as the second and third most influential recruitment challenges they face. Clearly, there is work to be done to convey the value of a humanities education more effectively to students and those who influence them. For humanities disciplines not commonly taught in K-12 schools, students may have little to no understanding of what these fields consist of, much less what one can do with them. But respondents also noted that a more widespread lack of understanding of how humanities disciplines are taught at the undergraduate level and how they might be applied in the real world presents a significant recruitment challenge for even presumably familiar fields like history and English. In our first webinar on articulating career pathways, our presenters flagged this as a PR problem, both for the humanities writ large and individual humanities disciplines. Indeed, we see significant opportunity to ramp up marketing efforts to counter misconceptions, misperceptions, and demonstrate urgent needs for humanities knowledge and skills in civic, social, and economic life. The third chapter of our new report, Strategies for Recruiting Students to the Humanities, a comprehensive resource presents a variety of strategies in terms of messaging, modes of communication and outreach uh, for delivering persuasive arguments for studying the humanities to key audiences. We've organized the marketing models presented into six subcategories, outreach to prospective students and their parents, branding and messaging, crafting engaging promotional media, mobilizing student ambassadors, and integrating a marketing mindset into everyday practices. We are aware that the term marketing may have negative connotations for some humanists. Nonetheless, the impressive work we have gathered under this heading is of crucial importance. Faculty frequently find that working to persuade students of the value of human humanistic education enhances their pedagogy. It helps realize the potential of the humanities to strengthen key civic institutions and promote social justice. And it is a crucial aspect of fostering a learning environment where everyone can feel they belong. We're excited to have three leaders with us today who are doing this important work at a high level in Professors Bender, Gregory, and Rosales. We hope you'll enjoy learning how they have worked to promote learning opportunities in the humanities at the department level, from the Dean's office, and through an interdisciplinary institute to attract a broader range of students. 
Melissa? Thanks, Scott. That was a, a great um, way to frame this. I really appreciate it. Let me start my timer here. Um, and it's just, can I just pick up on that comment about marketing? Um, one of my academic advisors, one of my favorite ones, she's really good, always says that her job is basically sales. She's like, students sit in front of me <laughs> and I have to sell them. So there's a part of me, it's like, we may not like marketing, but I think, you know, advisors feel like they have to sell classes to students in a lot of ways. So it's worth um, worth considering that. Okay, so I'm gonna kick us off today with some really broad approaches to humanities recruiting that are informed by my having transitioned from being a professor of English to an associate dean of a college of arts and letters. And this job has given me way more opportunity to have direct contact with people in admissions, which has been very valuable, and also to get more of a bird's eye view of what recruiting looks like across humanities departments. And some of the points I'm making today are gonna to seem maybe obvious, and if so, I apologize for that. And some of them could likely apply to all recruiting scenarios, but I think they're far more urgent when it comes to the humanities. So um, I'm going to go ahead and make them anyway. So I have three really broad points, and then I'm going to, at the end, rattle off a very short list of some hardcore specific strategies that I have used in the past that I've found helpful, and maybe you will find them helpful too. Okay, so my very first broad point is that we are all recruiters now, all of us, and that humanities departments need to cultivate a collaborative, all hands on deck attitude toward recruitment, where every single faculty member in the department feels personally responsible for recruiting. Um, I think recruitment can't just be a committee or a couple of events. It really does have to be a mindset, as the title of this panel suggests. And I know that a mindset shift or an attitude change may not feel that tangible to you, but please believe me when I say it makes a difference little by little, and it really informs your actions um, all the time in a way that's very valuable. So for example, um, 10 years ago, if an engineering major had come up to me and expressed interest in switching their major to English, I would have said, oh, yay, that's so great. You should go see your academic advisor and take care of that, and I'll see you soon. <laughs> These days, I walk the student to the advising office <laughs> and I introduce them. Um, and if it's an email connection, I copy like everybody on that message. And then a week later, I follow up to see if they have any questions and if the change has occurred and so forth. So basically, I think having a kind of recruiting mindset and feeling really personally responsible has made me way more tenacious about um, yielding students, as they say in admissions, and like making sure that we bridge those connections. Um, similarly, just like a couple of weeks ago, I was actually chatting with the checkout clerk at the Toledo Museum of Art gift shop. <laughs> and she mentioned that she was finishing her degree at a local community college. And she was thinking she'd really like to go on to a four year institution and study art history, but she didn't think there were any jobs in art history. So I made my entire family wait on a bench for 25 minutes while I took her through all of her options. <laughs> And so I gave her my card and I think there's actually an email from her in my box right now and then I'm going to get her connected to where she needs to go. And I know these examples are only about like one student at a time, although I'll take one student at a time, but I, I guess I just want to say, trust me, when you build a culture of recruitment, it will start to inform everything that you do. And I guarantee that the more everyone in your department sees themselves as personally committed to the mission, the more effectively you're going to be able to develop both short-term and long-term strategies. Like if your approach to recruitment is we do nothing until we're panicking about our enrollment drop, it's just not going to be as effective and you will be recruiting from a place of fear and panic and hopelessness. And that those just tend not to be good motivators, right? For anybody, anytime. Um, so my first point is we're all recruiters now, take responsibility for that. Number two is know your own demographic data. When it comes to recruiting, one size does not fit all. And you cannot recruit effectively unless you know who you are recruiting. So choose recruitment strategies that are appropriate to your institutional context and to the demographics your school typically enrolls. And that means getting to know your data. For example, here are some questions that I think everybody in a department should actually know the answers to all the time. How many of your majors typically come from out of state versus the ones who come from in-state or your local community? How many of your students are receiving financial aid? How many are typically Pell eligible, meaning they have the highest financial need? How many students are receiving scholarships or tuition discounting from your institution? What percentage of your students are the first in their family to attend college? 
what are your racial, ethnic, and religious backgrounds of your students, or what are the religious, um, ethnic, and racial backgrounds of your students, both within your institution at large and within your major? What high schools do your students come from? Are these high schools historically reliable feeder schools for you or not? Are they parochial? Are they public? Get to know them. What percentage of your students are transfer students and from where? And are any of your majors felt returning students? And if so, how many? And I could keep going, but my point is that these data radically inform the way in which you reach out to prospective students. I'm going to have a much different pitch for a Pell eligible first generation college student than I will for a student who has a really advantaged background. In my personal experience, students who are high financial aid need really see um, professional development is a critical component of their undergraduate experience, right? They wanna know that they can get a job afterwards and that's kind of less true for really advantaged students who sort of assume that they will get a job. And so I need to know, right, like where my students are situated on that continuum so that I can reach out to them. I mean, if recruiting is about persuasion, then we all know that the a key to persuasion is knowing your audience. Um, for those of you who are wondering how do we get these data, well, your department chair probably has access to it on their institutional dashboards, but if your chair does not have access, then your dean's office should. And if that doesn't work, contact your admissions and enrollment office. This information is out there. And trust me when I say it is so much better to work with concrete data rather than to go with anecdotal experience because what you think you see or you think you know about your students may not necessarily be accurate in a kind of broader aggregate sense. Um, so just really quickly, for example, this is a retention example, not a recruitment example, but um, a couple of years ago, my assumption about my own college was that the demographic with the lowest six-year graduation rate was African-American men. And the only reason I thought that was because that was true at the university level. But then when I did like a data dive and looked really closely at my own college's specific data, I discovered that the African-American men in my college were actually doing really great. They had a great six-year retention rate, but that in fact, Latin X men did not. And this completely reorganized my priorities for the year in a whole variety of ways. And I think that example, like I said, it's, it's retention based, but you can easily imagine how it would map on to um, recruitment. So number one, we're all recruiters now. Number two, know your data. Number three, listen to your staff, academic advisors, admissions recruiters, student advocates, anyone else on your campus who works directly with students. These people are a gold mine of information about what your students want and what they need, what they say they need. Um, they get all kinds of unfiltered feedback. You don't get unfiltered feedback if you're faculty, you only get it if you're staff. Um, and you should make a note of like a point of getting to know these folks and really engaging with them. So for example, one mistake that I see over and over is that humanities departments kind of get panicky about enrollment and they just decide that they're gonna sort of solve their enrollment drop problem by changing their curriculum, often by creating like new classes that they think will somehow make them seem more relevant or current. But when they do that, they often completely neglect to talk to the people who might actually be able to tell them that maybe curriculum isn't the issue at all, or that there's a totally different aspect of their curriculum that's a problem for students that is, you know, not at all what they thought, right? So if you have those folks, really engage with them. If you have a recruiter assigned to your college, for example, talk to that person, or at the very least contact admissions and have a meeting with all the recruiters assigned to your area. Talking to recruiters gives you a chance to educate them, right? And you can always sweeten the deal by giving them swag and nice things, but you will also learn a ton by listening to them about what they are seeing and hearing from prospective students. I mean, if I wanna know what social media platform I should be using for recruiting, um, I'm gonna ask my 20 something recruiter, right? I'm not gonna turn to my 50 year old colleague. <laughs> And so um, the lesson here is that staff who works with students know things and you should take advantage of that. So I have one minute left. Here are, as I promised, some specific strategies that um, have worked for me in the past. My three broad recommendations are cultivate a recruiting mindset, know your demographic data, and uh, talk to your staff. Specific strategies include one, High impact practices, in my experience, really, really sell. 
one of the challenges of humanities recruiting is that we do a lot of life of the mind kind of work and that doesn't photograph very well on flyers. <laughs> so if you have field trips, internships, contact with special visitors or outside guests, study abroad, anything that helps students to imagine themselves outside the classroom and kind of actively engage, that's usually a useful outward facing thing to promote. Um, two real life examples and testimonials from successful alumni are incredibly meaningful to students. Like, look, I got a philosophy degree at the University of Toledo and now I am in med school. And it's best if those examples are recent and not from like 1953. Um, three, if you're creating recruiting materials for students like flyers or social media posts, use direct address. Don't say in this major, the student can take this core course plus these electives and then they will have completed you know, the major. Rather say, you can take this core course plus these electives. It's a simple linguistic trick, but it does a lot. Four, target your efforts carefully. Don't waste your precious energy on random events. If you're the Department of English, for example, what's more valuable? You could sit lost at a huge recruiting fair where you know there's a lot of noise, or maybe you send some people to set up a table at your local poetry slam contest and then you hand out flyers, right? That might be worth more. Um, and number five, finally, in my experience, almost all parents tend to want institutions to care about their kids, right? To treat them with kindness and compassion and to have support ready if they need it. So all of my humanities recruiting is done from within a context of, we will take the best care of you possible. And that may be a kind of universal, I don't know, but that's where I will end. So thanks all. Right on, thank you so much, Melissa. Uh, so now Ashley's gonna take us and kind of drill down a little bit more into the how uh, there's some departmental strategies. Actually. It would help if I unmuted. Um, thank you, Scott, for um, inviting me to join this panel. Um, I am Ashley Bender, Assistant Professor of English, and for the last six years, I have been the BA Program Coordinator um, for the English program. Um, today, I'm going to share a little bit about you, um, uh, uh, share a little bit with you about who we are as a university. I cannot reinforce enough what Melissa said about knowing your own demographic that has made a huge difference in the strategies that we've used over the last five, six years. Um, in recruiting students. I'll talk about some of our external recruiting strategies, some uh, um, things that we do internally, I'll talk about some of the strengths of our program that we emphasize in our materials, and then I'll conclude by um, talking a little bit about some of the strategies we want to build into our existing um, recruiting program. I've also, um, I'll drop this link into the chat here in um, a couple minutes after I finish talking, but I did want to let you know I have put some materials together for you as just some examples um, of some of the different topics that I'm talking about. So, for example, um, uh, one the the postcard we send out to students, um, some instructions on how to use Gmail apps to uh, create uh, to mail merge and email a lot of students at one time, but make those emails seem really really personal. Um, so, who we are. Um, TWU is the um, is a regional university in the DFW Metroplex. We have a lot of competition, not just within our state, but actually like within a 90 mile radius, um, including two miles across town, um, a much bigger school known for its liberal arts programs. We have about 15,000 students across three different campuses. Denton, where I am, is the main campus. Um, most of our students come from Texas. We're a minority, majority, HSI. 42% of our students are Pell Grant eligible. We have a very large percentage of first generation college students. And we are known for our health sciences. Students come to us for health sciences, for OT, for PT, for nursing. Um, let's see. So our students are a strong mix of um, transfer students. We do have a strong population of first time in college students as well. But we have a lot of, we have four main feeder um, community college districts in the area, but many others through the, throughout the state of Texas that send their students to us. Um, students come to us from a broad range of preparedness, some very underprepared, and others that we have some students that would do swimmingly at Harvard, um, but 
we are close to home and we are affordable. Um, and then um, let's see, a lot of students these days are very career oriented. They want to know what they can do with their degree. That is one of the first questions um, that parents especially, but also students will ask me at our different recruitment events. The English program is um, pretty small compared to some of our other programs. Last fall, we hit a peak of 136 majors, up from a 10-year deficit of 104 majors. We have 15 faculty that serve three different degree-granting programs, as well as two minors. Our BA program has three different tracks, so in that sense, we're in keeping with other trends in English programs um, across the discipline. Obstacles that we face. Funding, and I think that's a top obstacle for many programs. Time, um, human resources. As the program coordinator, I get a course release to do this work on recruitment, um, but the rest of my colleagues do not, which means a lot of the, the work of recruitment falls on to me. Um, so we need more faculty buy-in and we need more internal stakeholders. Uh, we need more of these people to, to, to buy into the value of our programs. Um, so for example, um, because we're a health sciences school, our health programs get plugged and, and promoted a lot, but you won't drive down the I-35 corridor and see a sign that says arts and humanities at TWU. Um, so we have to find ways to tell our story and get that story out to as many prospective students as possible. One of the most effective ways that we do this is emailing students directly. Um, this is a practice that I started maybe four years ago. We used to have call campaigns. We would get call lists from admissions and we would divide them up among faculty. And it was really ineffective. Nobody liked to do it. So I started taking these lists and instead of calling students, I would email them because when I emailed, not always by any means, but I, I received far more responses in return this way. So um, our admissions office sends us monthly prospect lists. And when I get those lists, I also then look up any recent uh, students who have recently been admitted to our program. And then I send out one of two emails, you know, an email about the English major at TWU, um, and then a modified version of that that says, congratulations on your acceptance to TWU. Um, and uh, I do this in order to help establish relationships, to answer some questions they may have about our program and maybe questions they, they, they didn't know they had and to put a person um, or a, 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 in a contact to the program. In fact, recently I received, um, this would have been a couple months ago, I received an email um, in response, are you a real person? And I was able to take my picture and send it back to them and say, yes, I am in fact a real person. Um, but it makes a huge difference, right? It establishes that culture of care um, from our first like real communication with them that Melissa has already suggested is so important to recruiting students to our programs. Um, uh, one recent email list, um, our, our admissions office sent us a list of names that they had either gotten from maybe some ACT tests or pre-SAT tests. So I was able to email 600 students at one time. Um, and it, it matters because I had a 15 year old student respond back to me having an existential crisis about not knowing what she wants to do. And so I set up a meeting with her and we talked about how it, at 15 going on 16, you don't have to have all those answers yet. But we talked about what an English degree can do. We talked about how an English degree complements other interests that she has, including potentially attending medical school. And while she won't be applying to our program for another two years, I already have that contact with her, right? I'm someone that she knows that she can reach out to. Um, so I have in the folder I've set up for you, I've provided instructions on mail merge. I've provided a sample e email that I send to my students. Um, and another thing that this does is it allows us to control the message about our program. We can tell our story best, right? We know our program far better than someone in, in admissions um, who, who doesn't know the full ins and outs of all of the great things that you can do with an English degree. So it feels more personal um, and um, it, it gives us that connection.
Um, so something else that we do that builds off of this is putting students in touch with putting current students in touch with prospective students. Um, we're developing a shadowing program and because we're fortunate right now to have a student worker in our office who's also an English major, um, they're able to do some of this work while on the clock. They're giving a tour in a week or two to a student who's interested in our program. Um, so we try and put students in touch with each other. We personalized a postcard um, that we send out. We have found small mail, uh, small, small mail, mailable, um, small items to mail are much more effective than than brochures, right? No, nobody looks at brochures anymore. Um, and these postcards are things that we can send to community colleges, um, especially to chairs of English departments, as well as to community college instructors, as well as to local high school teachers. So this, these are some other external um, recruitment strategies that we use and that we are currently building. Uh, we had to cancel it because of COVID, but we are planning um, uh, a, a small event for community college chairs in the area for to, to invite them to campus to show them our uh, we have this really cool digital composition lab that um, allows our students to compose in many different media um, and uh, we'll have a lunch there talk to them about our program and send them off with materials that they can put up on their walls so that there will be some name recognition and that's one of the things that we're trying to do with our external recruitment strategies is to build um, more name recognition for our program. Uh, with so many universities in Texas, TWU isn't one that necessarily just comes to mind for students, especially students who have interest in the humanities. So we have to do um, a better job of getting our name out there for um, our humanities programs. As far as internal strategies, I think these are going to be familiar to to a lot of you, right? Lower division courses is one of the are, are one of the best places that we can recruit students, right? Um, it's including first year composition, but first year comp in those lower division literature courses for us, um, that's that's where if if I can't turn them into English majors, a lot of times I can turn them into an English minor, right? Which is just as important as uh, just as important, right? We want to grow our majors, but we also want to connect more students with the humanities. So emphasizing the value of an English minor is pivotal to that. And it's a great um, student credit hour booster. Um, at our school, after students complete the core curriculum, it's only three more classes to get the minor. So we emphasize the ease and speed with which they can do that. And we're working on building specific tracks or suggested tracks for specific majors to help make the program or an English minor more enticing. Um, some strengths that we emphasize, professional development. We do not shy away from professional development, um, just as we don't shy away from the idea of marketing. We embrace this, right? And we embrace things as strengths of our program. We do a lot of career development because our students need it. They don't, a lot of our students come to us not knowing the language of professional development, not knowing the, the, the um, dispositions that they need. We have to teach that to them. We see that as an ethical obligation. We emphasize our experiential education, um, uh, which is very strong in our program, our digital composition lab, our small class size, teacher-student teacher ratio, as well as the amounts of choice students have from the tracks that they choose to the electives that they get to choose um, on those tracks. So finally, I just want to point out a couple of things that we're going to try and do looking ahead. As Melissa suggested, we're going to work on more joint recruitment with other humanities programs in our school, join forces with them. We want to increase our faculty investment, increase contact between um, a current students and prospective students, build our alumni connections, and also improve our website practices so that we're using our website more effectively. Excellent. Thank you, Ashley. And uh, wanted to just make a reminder, I'm seeing some questions come in, but please keep the questions coming as we prepare to discuss all these uh, overlapping themes uh, in the uh, following Oliver's presentation. Oliver. All right. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, I want to thank uh, Scott. Um, Melissa and Ashley for uh, your presentations and inviting me, uh, Scott. Um, 
you know, I, I'm really uh, dwelling on Ashley's uh, comment about connecting students with the humanities. I think this is something that I've certainly done during my tenure at Bakersfield College. And, you know, when Melissa is talking from an administrative point of view about the numbers and the data, um, that's exciting to me. It's not something I have vast experience in, but as a, a faculty member and a grant writer, um, I know that's a direction that I'm, I'm going in. So this is really, really exciting. Um, I wanted to share just briefly some of the uh, strategies and approaches I've taken to do what Ashley was talking about in terms of connecting students uh, to the humanities. And I've mostly done that at uh, Bakersfield College. This is a two-year community college in the Central Valley of California, about two hours north of Los Angeles. Uh, mostly first-generation students. Um, it's undergone a, a pretty radical transformation in the last 10 years to a Latinx student majority. Um, and that's been, um, I think, in some ways, there's growing pains institutionally, right? Uh, when we think about how we service that student population. And it's, it's, it's in that vein that I've tried to do work outside the classroom in the humanities. And so uh, through my role as a faculty coordinator for the Social Justice Institute, which does have some uh, release time attached to it as I was doing this work, um, I've gone after a number of grants and programs to try to connect students with the humanities. Um, one of the ones that was uh, successful recently, it's just wrapping up right now, was um, the community college initiative through the NEH, um, essentially bringing in you know, scholars and folks who wrote about rural communities, agricultural communities um, from interdisciplinary perspectives. Uh, and bringing them to the region that they wrote about, right? And connecting them directly with students. Um, what I found in doing some of the institutional data perusing was that, you know, a lot of faculty who taught at the institution um, didn't develop a curriculum. So that kind of goes to Melissa's point where that was actually my, um, you know, argument that I was making in grants was that, you know, the curriculum needed to do a better job re reflecting the lived experiences of students. Um, and so that grant was, was very successful. We brought a number of speakers in over the course of the years and had various programs um, that again, helped faculty design a curriculum that was more effect effective in engaging students in humanities topics that were relevant to their lives. Um, another uh, project that we did through the Institute uh, that's currently going on is, is working with our um, incarcerated student population, uh, as well as our formerly incarcerated student population. So um, my community college has <clears throat> the largest um, uh, number of sections offered, uh, not only in the humanities, um, uh, in <clears throat> uh, prisons, essentially, in, in the state of California at the community college level. And uh, a lot of the students, right, when they're transitioning out, or uh, the, the inmates, right, the when they transition out, they come to, to Bakersfield College. And so we designed a grant program that did a, a, a number to tell their stories to people because we felt that there was, you know, huge misunderstandings in some ways, right, about, you know, formerly incarcerated students and their experiences. And I'm not sure if it was in this panel or some other panel I was on, but, you know, seeing those students, like, um, you know, folks aren't advertising themselves as a formerly incarcerated person. And so, but it's important for them to tell their stories of transformation and help them imagine, you know, a future, um, you know, whether it's going into like counseling or thinking about, you know, uh, how, state budgets are spent on, 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 um, on, on prison systems, right? Or the carceral state as the scholars would call it. Um, wanted to share too, an example of a very interdisciplinary humanities um, project that I was um, associated with, um, the Health and Social Justice Hackathon. Um, I didn't have a sponsor page on this particular grant, but I think this, this particular project we did had at least like 30 to $40,000 behind it. It had you know, support from our local business community, uh, you know, philanthropists, as well as, um, you know, our Cal the California Endowment, which had a huge public health initiative going back about five, six years ago. So we ran this hackathon event for at least three years, and it was a, a kind of annual student competition where you uh, use a humanities approach to storytelling, right, and identifying uh, health inequalities within your community. And, you know, it, it pulled together people and students from across disciplines. You know, you needed the storytellers, you needed the folks from, um, you know, computer science who could do like app work. Um, you needed folks from business who could, you know, uh, manage the team. Um, and there were prizes and whatnot, but it was a very successful event in terms of generating you know, really wide community interest. And um, I don't have it on this page, but I'll share the, um, the example. Um, there was a student who actually developed an app uh, to identify medical providers 
who were LGBTQ sensitive, right? And that, that was, that actually got picked up and, and, and I think the student made, you know, a small profit off of that, but uh, it was an example of a real world apl application. Um, one other thing I wanted to share that was exciting, I think that we've done recently um, is we had, uh, I think there was, maybe it was Scott who mentioned the, the student ambassador concept. Um, so um, we did a grant, um, uh, with a local nonprofit as well as the Mellon Foundation uh, to cultivate a student pipeline into youth journalism. Um, and we did this by partnering with uh, an organization called Kernsoul News, uh, which basically develops like youth journalists within the rural communities, like very small communities that have, you know, maybe 10 to 20,000 people, but no local newspaper. And so that was the approach. And what we did through the grant was to uh, provide a fellowship opportunity for those students to work with Pulitzer Prize winners, you know, local journalists on TV and radio. Uh, they went to like the, the NPR studios and then they, they get to do local journalism. And all this is through the community college. You know, it's all through uh, this kind of recruitment um, strategies that we're talking about. And um, I'd, I'd say what I, what I find you know, the past, you know, seven years or so is there's a lot of interest from like nonprofit foundations and certainly the, the federal government with community colleges, right? With Jill, Jill Biden in the White House, like um, I think there's a special moment to do really, really super innovative programs. And, you know, I'm trying to involve myself in this as much as I can, just from the perspective of, you know, a faculty member. Um, running out of time here, I do want to keep to the 10 minute clock, uh, but I just want to share one final example. So, uh, this is our, our, our president, now chancellor, Sonia Christian, who's a very well-respected community college leader, not only in California, but the United States. She does a weekly blog. And this is just an example of, of, of a humanities film screening event that we did uh, with a film called Audio Some More. It was funded by the National Endowment, had a number of students attend. But what we did is we involved students. Like everything that I have ever done in terms of public programming has students at the, the forefront of it. So they were the discussants. They got to discuss the film that related to their lives. It was a story of you know agriculture and migration. We brought the filmmaker. Um, we did the same thing when we brought um, uh, the Las Cafeteras, which is a very um, you know, important band out of Los, East Los Angeles, like they do hybrid music, they've a uh, very successful band, and it wasn't just a concert, but we, you know, had students sprinkled out throughout the, con the concert sharing their stories, you know, in, you know, in front of hundreds of people uh, about how agriculture, migration, and citizenship, you know, has impacted their lives, and so again, there's a storytelling element to it, so these are just some examples of, you know, ways that I've tried to, um, you know, embed the humanities across grant programming. And it's certainly, I think, attracted people to the work that I'm doing at Bakersfield College. And like Melissa was indicating, for me, my next steps are to try to track the data and to match that with, you know, grant opportunities. So thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you so much, Oliver, and to all three of our present presenters for these wonderful presentations. We've got some great questions coming in. So I'm gonna start fielding those. Um, let's start with a question um, about uh, so collaborating with university marketing. So the question was, what are your favorite ways to collaborate with university marketing? And what can we do as marketing professionals to better help facilitate collaboration with our humanities faculty. So I, this is coming from somebody I think working from that background. Would you guys like to- I'll just that? jump right in there and say that um, I, I would say as somebody in the Dean's office, of course, I want whatever is coming out from departments to be in line with whatever the branding is for marketing. And so we rely heavily on marketing to make sure that we're not off-roading or going rogue in some kind of way that's going to distress um, the senior leadership of the institution. Um, I will say that in my experience, our marketing department is wonderful, but they are catering to the entire rest of the university. So we tend to use them for really bigger projects where we have a lot more of an, uh, a lead time, right, to kind of help them work through it. Um, and then we will do our own internal stuff and make sure that we're in line with the branding and with whatever they're doing. And of course, it's not just marketing, but also admissions. You know, you can't necessarily, I think, just do an end run around what your enrollment um, 
office is doing. But uh, yeah, I will say that that for me, just the opportunity to kind of sit down with people in marketing and talk to them is always really valuable. And in my experience, a lot of marketing students are human, or marketing uh, officers rather, are humanities majors. So I feel like that um, bridge is often pretty easy to connect personally. Great, thanks. We've had really good success collaborating with our marketing department. Um, and a lot of what we do is we will create the copy ourselves. So we'll usually start having some kind of meeting talking about whatever product it is we want to develop um, to make sure we're all on the same page. But we do a lot of the content creation and then we send that off to them with you know, it's some discussion of this is how we want it to feel. This is kind of how we want it to look like. And they do a lot of the graphic design work um, that they're really good at and we aren't as good at. And sometimes they'll also cut your content, which is usually to the good. I mean, I feel like as, as humanities professors, we write paragraphs and it turns out, surprise, these do not really translate on posters or whatever other material, you know, you're trying to get out there. Uh, Oliver, you wanna? I haven't done much collaborating with marketing departments at universities, although I've done some collaborative grant work. And uh, again, I would just reiterate that I think a lot of granting agencies are excited about the prospect of community colleges and universities working together. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, I also wanted to take up kind of a cluster of questions that came in around uh, thinking about Pell eligibility and the connection to recruitment strategies. There were some questions about like, do you use that language? Is that internal language? Uh, correct, right? Yeah, that was my understanding as well. Um, but but also just, you know, there was a question about, you know, how you sort of balance the priorities of uh, maybe more, what perhaps have been more traditional constituencies for some um, and trying to reach a broader range of students and how they how to kind of think about that it's going back to one of the, your first points you raised, Melissa, about you know different messages for different audiences. So I didn't know if if anybody else wanted to sort of share kind of thoughts on that in terms of how you how you think about that and and how you know thinking about your internal language versus your external language. Um. So, sorry, um, so internally, um, the students are already here, right? They're already with us. We don't have to worry about actually getting them to choose TWU. What we're trying to do now is get them to choose the major. So um, a, lo a lot of times for that, we'll, we'll focus even more on um, uh, their career goals and interests. What do you want to do? And let me show you how the English major or English minor can help you get there. Um, especially in terms of recruiting students to the minor. Um, I, I do a lot of that just like while I'm teaching a class um, and when we're talking about um, you know, I'll, talk, I'll be talking about a particular project, introducing a project to students and talking about the skills they will gain through that project. And that gives me, you know, that's a really good segue into them talking about how the skills more broadly in the program can be helpful. So these are things that at least me personally, I try and weave into what I'm already doing. Um, you know, we, we attend the various marketing events on campus, um, like major fairs, minor fairs. Um, I, we, we, students don't generally stop at our booth. You know, that's not something that, um, as Melissa mentioned, right, going to these fairs is not necessarily the best use of our time. Um, and we're still figuring out ways to attract more students to our table when we are there. Um, in terms of the, you know, when we're addressing um, uh, prospective, prospective students, right, who haven't chosen TWU yet, um, we, we do still emphasize career a lot, but then we also emphasize choice. Um, in fact, um, our, our um, 
postcard that we use, the, the three sort of areas. Uh, we, we talk about you can customize your degree, right? Um, individualize it, which is really important to students. And then our second big um, section is preparing for your career. And then we emphasize community. So we try and hit notes that um, um, we think students will find really appealing about our university as a whole. Yeah, could I just amplify Ashley's point that um, I think it's about hitting notes, right? It's not necessarily like treating a group of prospective students as if they are all, you know, radically different because, you know, some of them have high financial need and some of them don't. But if I say something like our department, you know, curriculum really supports study abroad, I know that for my particular student demographics, I need to also mention the fact that study abroad is often more financially feasible than you may have thought because your financial aid generally transfers. And so I make sure that I work that in there, that I drop it in um, to, to capture that audience. Um, and I guess I will also say that I think the real key for all of us is really getting those students who haven't chosen our universities yet, right? Because, um, you know, once they're inside, I mean, yeah, engineering can afford to spare a couple of their majors if they convert to English, but ultimately that is a form of self-cannibalization for the institution, right? And what we need are those majors from outside. So that's where I would also, I also tend to, you know, direct people's energies toward creating, you know, pulling in those people from the, the, like the funnel and then as it you know narrows you kind of recruit accordingly uh, this question was directed to oliver but others may have thoughts on this too what, what are the best places to search for grant opportunities yeah, that's a great question. I mean, my institution is actually in the process of hiring a new grants coordinator. And so we're very excited about that. It's been great being a part of that committee. I mean, obviously grants.gov is, is a great point uh, for looking for things. Um, I'm fortunate to be a member of our state humanities council in California, sort of representing the Central Valley. So I, I'm privy to a lot of you know information that comes in through that agency, um, but it's not easy. I. I think for, for me, what, what, I, what I think when it comes to grants is identifying the need. You know, what, what are the institutional needs? Like you're saying, you have to talk to your, your pathway folks, your staff, and, and then, you know, find a grant that, that matches that. Um, but I think there's also lots of, um, you know, interesting external partners that can come to your, your university or college and, and talk about grant development. I, I think it's at community colleges anyway, it's kind of um, under, under the radar. It's much more normative, right, at R1 or four-year universities. But, you know, I think, again, there's, this is a special moment, I think, with Jill Biden in the White House um, to do these kind of really innovative, you know, partnerships. But um, there's no magical place to go for for grants. I mean, grants.gov is mostly the federal stuff. So, but there's a lot of nonprofit stuff out there too. Great, thank you. I, if I could add on one thing to that really quickly, um, if you um, the your state's commission on the arts, so in Texas, it's the Texas Commission for the Arts. Um, may also have uh, offer some grants to help bring um, artists and musicians to your campus, which can uh, create some of those um, experiences that Melissa talked about having your photographers at. I was able to get a grant um, to bring the state uh, poet laureate to campus a couple of years ago. And as part of that, she, she not only did a poetry reading, but she did uh, a writing workshop for our students. Uh, so a uh, question that came in, uh, it was mentioned toward the beginning that one challenge is that parents sometimes steer their children away from the humanities. What suggestions can you offer on how to engage parents effectively? I'm just going to jump in really quick. I don't think anybody excels at doing something that they don't love, right? We excel when we're doing something that we love. And I tell parents that it is our job to help take that passion that a student has for a subject and then to help them professionalize through internships, through applied experiences, through all kinds of ways. And, and to remind them, and when I say that, often that line resonates with parents because we're adults now and we all know what happens when we do something we don't like, <laughs> how it affects our overall success and how many people are out there living lives that they're unhappy with because someone told them they should be this kind of person when really they wanted to be some other kind of person, right? And they end up really shortchanging themselves for sometimes decades because of that. And so, um, I don't know, that's my, that's my pitch. 
I can just comment really briefly. Um, one of the ways that I try to engage, you know, parents is, is obviously through curriculum, like family oral histories, but in the future with this project I'm working on using uh, like ArcGIS technologies, and this is collaborative with my university or in, in my area, um, is, is trying to design, you know, family-based uh, archival projects that where students have to engage their families to do the, the, re the research and, and the, the, the public facing work. But again, it's something that can be shown at the end because the, the data becomes aggregated. You can create story maps and, you know, it combines all kinds of, you know, disciplines. And so it, it's exciting for parents uh, who don't think of their own migrations and whatnot as being relevant, right? And so I think when they can tie that to their, 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 their children's success in school, that becomes exciting. <clears throat> Yeah, and I'll just briefly say to connect this question to the earlier question about inclusion and engaging different kinds of audiences. We have a couple of profiles in the strategies resource about colleges that have been, you know, made an effort to really connect with families and that for Pell eligible first generation populations, the family being involved in, you know, in events, in, in communications with students can really help increase retention and help them just understand more about what their students are studying and get excited about it rather than just seeing it as some kind of mysterious thing that, um, you know, not sure how it connects to a career. Um, so, um, okay, next question. So, do, uh, S Susan Hengen asks, do we have, any evidence that curricular changes in the humanities can actually increase enrollment in these majors? I'm a dean and hope the answer is yes. Some faculty faculty are skeptical. What do you think? Let me take that up. I, I only have anecdotal proof that after we changed our major and we um, made tracks for students um, and started connecting those tracks more carefully to how students can apply them. Our enrollments did go up by about 30%. That's not anecdotal proof, Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually quantitative and very valuable. <laughs> And can I just say, I think absolutely. I mean, and there's all kinds of other evidence out there, right? That students need to see themselves within a curriculum in order to want to connect to it and thrive. I would just say, I think my comment about changing curriculum was more like, don't just do it based on what you think a student might find relevant. Like, oh, you know, <laughs> I think our students might like this. I mean, there's a fair amount of arrogance in that kind of assumption, but it's often one that faculty default to in, in my experience, and I'm, I'm sure I've been guilty of it. Um, yeah, you know, again, talk to people about what some of the issues are. I mean, go to your academic advisors and be like, hey, what issues do you see with our majors? You know, um, are students talking to you about our major in a particular way? Um, and get that, you know, collect information and do it really intentionally, but in dialogue with other people. Uh, I, I also just want to add quickly, like, I don't, yeah, I don't want to sidetrack us, but like, you know, gosh, um, you know, in California, we have a new, a new state law that's mandating ethnic studies. Uh, I think the Title V was just reformed. So now ethnic studies is going to be a community college requirement. And with the, all the rhetoric about, you know, CRT, like we have to go out <laughs> to families and explain to them, you know, why ethnic studies is important. And so I, I'm really appreciating <laughs> this space right now. <laughs> Right, right on. And I, I would say just the, the thing I would add is that I think marketing and curricular innovation at their best go hand in hand. And so a curricular, you know, a new program is an opportunity to promote not only this new program, but also the traditional strengths of your humanities program. And uh, it's a way to kind of shine a light on things you may already be doing uh, in a new way. And, you know, and again, to the point that you do it in a way that you've, you've kind of done your homework and it's actually something that students are interested in and, and then will resonate with them. So, but you can't just build the curricular innovation and expect, you know, if you build it, they will come. You've got to really promote it effectively, I think. It, so it's really key to kind of put the two together. Can I just add one thing? I'm going to push back only slightly. 
which is to say that sometimes marketing the humanities is just a matter of repackaging what you do and rendering it visible sure. for your current audience. And I think if your curriculum and your you know philosophy department looks like the curriculum you had in 1953, then that is an educational pedagogical problem. <laughs> Um, it means you're not really delivering, I think, a great education to your students because it hasn't been updated in years and years and years. But in terms of marketing, if you're teaching Plato in your philosophy department, there are all kinds of ways in which I can market Plato and you don't have to invent a whole new Plato studies plus engineering program for me to make sure that Plato seems relevant, if that makes sense, right? Sometimes it's just a matter of reframing and repackaging the skill sets, um, it doesn't always have to result, I think, in like a new, you know, actual program or certificate. Certificates are all the rage right now. Um, yeah, so so I do think it's useful to say curriculum innovation and marketing relate to each other, but sometimes they're completely different enterprises and the marketing is really its own kind of animal about, you know, yeah, that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> I also think it's really helpful to have a clear set of outcomes in mind. Um, you know, bef before we began the process of overhauling our curriculum, we actually sat down and, tr and, and tried to figure out collectively as a faculty, why do we need to make these changes and what do we want the outcome of these changes to be? And one of the one of the main reasons we we chose a track system was because our students our, our students come to us and they, they want to get in and out as quickly as possible because they want to get those jobs. And so they're just willy nilly picking classes that don't necessarily speak to each other. There's no cohesion among um, you know, the, the, the different options that they're choosing. And so by creating a track system, they still have that choice. They still have flexibility, but we're, we're giving them some boundaries to work with so that when they do go on the job market, they can make the connections among the classes that they're taking when they tell the story of why this hiring manager should choose them for this job. So uh, a, a couple, we're getting towards the end of our time here. There was a question about small liberal arts colleges as a, as a different kind of environment than we have represented here today. I just wanted to make a plug for checking out the strategies resource. There's some good examples from that context there. There was also a question about um, community, the community college to four-year institution connections. And, you know, that's been talked about by all three of you. And so um, any suggestions of educating students on the monetary value of a humanities degree long-term versus the sort of quicker payoff college scorecard mindset? It was a question kind of framed around the community college transfers specifically. I can try to address it briefly. Like, um, you know, I, 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 through my grant programming stuff, like I try to bring people who do stuff. Like it's that simple. Like when we're talking about measurable outcomes and deliverables, you know, it's not only like butts in the seat, but like people who are coming to campus, those encounters that you can measure that students experience outside the classroom, like like Melissa's talking about. And you you have to show real world application. You have to track the the alumni from your program and. Uh, or else students can't envision themselves doing anything. And, and there, there are some, I think, you know, more kind of like uh, state and national databases that we use to, to show, you know, okay, here's the projected outcome of a humanities major versus something else. And, you know, I, I reference that, but I guess I try to just change the mindset of my students. Like, you know, like you'll get a job. <laughs> Do you want to like be happy? Like, you know, or something like that. Like you know, appealing to those you know, traditional, you know, humanities, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, belief systems, if you want to call it that, but I'd love to hear from Melissa or Ashley on that. Well, I just want to add, um, you know, we don't just tell our students you'll get a job. We say, we'll help you get a job. Right. And we and we we tell them that from the beginning for their the gateway course is is has built in professionalization. The capstone course has built in professional development and we have an annual career day and we do a lot of things along the way, including personal one on one interview practice. Right. If a student comes to us with. Um, uh, with a request to help with their with their resume and cover letter. Yes, we do outsource some of this to our career connections, um, but we do a lot of that in house too, right? And we do a lot of that training, and that's it. That's for all, uh, not just our undergraduate, but our, our masters and our PhD programs as well. Um, in that that close connection, um, and in the fact that that we are willing to do that, I think is very appealing to our students. 
Right on. Well, we are we are coming to the end of our time. Well, as I mentioned, there were some specific questions. We're going to collect those. We'll share responses to those in a in a Google Doc to follow. But we really appreciate all of you being here, and we really really appreciate these wonderful presentations from our panelists, and even more importantly, the excellent work you're doing on your campuses to attract more students to the humanities. So, thanks very much, and uh, hope to see you in a couple weeks the next one.